Okay, welcome everybody. Um, this is really special to have you here. I know it can be a little tricky figuring out Zoom. It took me a long time to figure out Zoom. Um, this is very new technology and um, I think it is the future. Um, normally um, in a typical gallery experience and exhibition, we would be limited to the people that either live very close to the gallery or can afford to fly in for a gallery show. And you know, that's a really small group of people. So um, the silver lining here of the shutdown is that it has forced us to really bring a much more democratic way of sharing art to the public. Um, so this will definitely be the first of many. Um, we were sort of thrown into this and I'm so glad we were. Um, we've been working out the kinks and I'm praying that I don't have any technical difficulties on my end today, but you never know. Okay, so uh, let's see. I moved, if you may know this, but I moved um, to New Mexico in August, and um, I'd lived in New York for five years, and it was great, um, but it was just time to um, reconnect with nature. So Sasha and I packed Foxy in the car, and we did a, <laughs> and we drew, um, we did a road trip across the country, and um, stayed in some Airbnbs for a few months until we could find just the right piece of land to call home. We ended up finding a parcel within a much larger um, piece of conservation land that's called the Big Wonderful. And when I heard that name for the Big Wonderful, I was like, that's perfect. That's a perfect name for this show. So um, we are now building a studio and a house here. And um, for the past several months, I've been working on this collection, which I'm gonna share with you today. I'm going to um, go deeper into nine of the 14 paintings that are in the show. So we're here, we're trying to simulate that gallery experience that you would have received if you were able to attend a show. And um, rather than just me rambling on and on and on, um, we're going to, um, be so lucky to have um, Gabrielle and Donovan here. Um, they have such a cool background in philosophy and they are going to be able to take this dialogue into um, a really cool place. So welcome to the show. And we have an audience chat. We encourage you to ask questions. And then at the end of um, this set, we're going, I'm going to try to answer as many of those as I can, okay? So I'm going to hand it out over now to Gabrielle. Well, that's great, Iris. Thanks very much. Um, so hi, everyone. Good afternoon or good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. As you've already demonstrated, you're around the world. So that's really wonderful. We're very lucky to be able to bring this to so many different parts of the world through the magic of technology. Uh, and I really want to thank you all for being here today to take the time to be with us. Uh, the Big Wonderful was supposed to debut last month as a brick and mortar show in Wayzata, Minnesota with our friends Burnett Fine Art and Advisory. But I think we're all aware of why that got postponed. Uh, Iris's art will eventually make its way to Minnesota though, and we very much look forward to seeing her paintings on the walls of Burnett Fine Art in the fall. Um, so many thanks to our friends in Minnesota for their encouragement and their flexibility during this time. We really appreciate you guys. So a bit about us. Um, I founded Philosophy Arts in 2017. We are a contemporary art gallery based in New York City, and we're also a progressive educational organization. Uh, we are very much dedicated to the advancement of critical thinking, art appreciation, and philosophy for adults and children. So why would an art gallery do that? Well, very briefly, uh, I haven't seen anyone else doing it. And so it provides us an opportunity to fill what we believe is a need uh, to bring uh, philosophers and artists together to deepen and enrich the dialogue that happens around contemporary art. So much of it is sort of, of art criticism and the, the basic press that artists get for their work, but really digging deeper is something that we wanted to explore. Uh, our primary purpose though, of course, is to promote and sell art. All of these paintings Iris will introduce to us are for sale, and we're happy to answer your questions and your sales inquiries via email after the presentation. 
Um, but beyond art as a commodity, these works uh, exist in the world and they have deep meaning and value. And lots of people, thanks to the internet, form relationships to these works, whether or not they ever have the opportunity to see them in person. So for our purposes now, they serve as a stimulus for philosophical dialogue and learning. It's my belief and hope that this conversation we're about to have will further enrich everyone's engagement with Iris's art. I'd like to introduce you now to Dr. Donovan Irvin, Philosophy Arts Director of Philosophical Praxis. Donovan holds a PhD in philosophy from Purdue University. We met and became friends and colleagues over a decade ago when we were in grad school together studying philosophy, uh, earning, earning our masters. Uh, he has been a part of Philosophy Arts from the very beginning, and I'm very thankful for that. Um, and he's been working with Iris since she first became part of the gallery, and that's been a really wonderful experience to see the collaboration between them in terms of producing philosophical writing about Iris's art and, uh, and helping to develop a manifesto for a genre of art that Iris created called instinctualism. Uh, Donovan, would you tell us a little bit more about you and your ideas around your role at Philosophy Arts? Sure. Uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do that. Thank you, Gabrielle. I really appreciate that. So for this show, as I was talking with Iris, I came to understand that the Big Wonderful is really as much a state of mind as it is a place. It's a beautiful place, like what Iris has discovered for herself in the grandeur of New Mexico, or really anywhere that inspires awe and wonder in us. Uh, but it's also that sense of wonder, that feeling that places can inspire in us, that mood that comes over us in the presence of a sublime landscape. So I think it's important to recognize that our psyche, our, who we are, is deeply rooted in places, in where we are and where we're going, which opens up perhaps, I think, the most pressing philosophical issue that people face, which is really the question of life's meaning. Uh, who am I? Where am I going? What's the meaning of all of this? And art provides an important, if not the primary, way that human beings express and communicate the meaning and significance of their lives and the world around them. And so what I really hope to achieve with Philosophy Arts is to help people enter into that philosophical conversation with art, with artists, and really with each other. Um, the work of art takes something abstract or symbolic, an idea or a concept, and it, and it puts that idea concretely before us. Um, it makes it flesh. So today, I'd like us to take a minute to sit with Iris's work. Um, even if we all can't be together in person, I still think we can spend a little time with her work uh, to both appreciate it and allow it to um, inspire us to think more deeply. And so after Iris walks us through her amazing new collection, I would want to invite everybody to join us in a slow looking exercise where you'll have the opportunity to comment on and ask questions about a specific pair of works, one of which will be by Iris, of course, and the other by Vincent van Gogh. Um, so it's important for us to be able to take sort of a moment and really ponder over a work of art and to try and let it speak to us and offer us insight into our place in the world. So after we've done some philosophy together, um, using you can use that Q&A function to uh, make comments or ask questions about the works of art at any time. After we do that more focused, slow looking exercise together, I just wanna open it up for general questions that you might have for Iris um, and uh, for any of us here. Um, so I look forward to reading all of your thoughts coming in um, over the course of the webinar and pondering these works of art with you all. So um, thanks everyone again for being here. And I just, I'll turn things back over to Gabrielle for a second. Great, thanks Donovan, I appreciate that. And, uh, and a, uh, an announce reminder that Donovan's the moderator of the presentation, so he's gonna keep us moving time-wise uh, time throughout. Um, so, and now uh, we turn our attention back to the person of the hour, or really the person of the day, because it happens to be her birthday. Happy birthday, Iris Scott. Uh, I'm 36 today. Wonderful. Um, so, Iris, as you know, has spent the past decade pioneering finger painting as fine art and establishing a whole new genre of art called instinctualism. She is an advocate for animals and the environment and the warmth and sincerity that emanates from within her about these issues becomes so infused in her paintings that she has found this great source of success in connecting with collectors and winning over critics uh, with her work. 
This is the third time Philosophy Arts is having the distinct pleasure of presenting the debut of a new body of work by Iris. Um, I could sing her praises all day, but without further ado, please welcome Iris Scott to present The Big Wonderful. Thank you, Gabby. My pleasure. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is um, we're going to go through a, a set of images um, that are part of this collection. And I'm going to just talk about the big ideas here and try to give you some insight on why I painted them. Um, what's so cool that um, Gabrielle and Donovan will bring to this is we're going to do some comparative analysis with other works um, by other artists. Sometimes I was doing it intentionally and sometimes I didn't even realize I had um, been drawing from these masters that I love. So um, let's go on to the first painting. Um, that would be Kookaburra Nightingale. Let's see, let's come up. Kook Kookaburra Nightingale is a gigantic painting. It's um, 96 inches wide by 72 inches tall. In this painting, um, we can see basically three zones of the planet. We can see um, the sort of cherry blossoms of um, Japan up in the top left corner where, where the moon is. And then um, to the right, at the bottom right corner, we see Pedernal, which is an iconic peak here in New Mexico. And then the, the, the bird is native to Australia. And I painted this large piece. I was um, unfortunately going through my feed and um, watching the news as Australia was going up in flames. And it was incredibly tragic. And I, I didn't want to paint the tragedy of it. I wanted to paint something that was about um, a, a persevering, um, surviving uh, little bird that has a slight little menace to its eyes. Very, um, it's a little survivor here. And you can kind of sense there is a glow in the bottom um, horizon. And that's a slight suggestion of the fires. But this painting is really about the rebirth and that everything will be okay because the planet is so very resilient. And then weirdly, after the painting, I found out that kookaburras eat snakes. And I didn't know why I just had to add that snake in there. But um, yeah, so that was a sort of weird little coincidence. Now, um, let's, let's go a little deeper into uh, that peak in the bottom right corner. Um, I have moved to northern New Mexico, and in northern New Mexico, um, Pedernal is a um, major landmark in the area. Uh, the artist, Georgia O'Keeffe, she painted Pedernal constantly and, um, and told many people that she owned, owned the mountain itself. Uh, I will be very lucky when the house is finished to um, be able to look um, at Petternell in the way she did. That is actually her house on the left side. So um, it was important to me to pick um, a place that was close to George O'Keefe's Ghost Ranch um, to sort of absorb the energy of her, her legacy. So those are sort of some of the big ideas there. And then let's move on now to the foliage in the front of the painting. That foliage is um, to me very reminiscent of a Henry Rousseau painting. So um, I can't tell you how many times I've been in front of a Henry Rousseau painting and just been obsessed with the way he depicts foliage. He has a really stylized way of doing it. And I think if you look at these two paintings by him, you'll see the influence there, especially right here. Um, I'm, I'm drawing from his, the inspiration, but I'm still trying to reimagine it into something that is my own. Um, so that's what I have to say about this piece. And um, let's, sort of, let's sort of hand it over to um, Gabrielle and Donovan, because they always have something interesting to say that I don't catch. Uh, yeah, well, I love this painting, Kookaburra Nightingale. Um, this, of course, with the, pa the magic of PowerPoint, this is not the full image. It appears cropped here, so we're missing the moon and uh, some of the bottom. Such is PowerPoint life, um, noted for next time. Uh, but 
the blending of these two different lighting scenes, I think is really spectacular and creates this heightened drama in the painting and these jewel tones in the flowers, in the body of the bird, uh, in the flickers of highlight that you've put on the scales of the snake really ties this uh, work of art together through that unity and variety of lighting uh, techniques. I also really like this idea or the reality that you have moved out to New Mexico so close to where George O'Keefe was. It was 104 years ago this month that she had the beginning of her success in uh, with her first show in New York City and uh, it was after trying, having achieved a certain level of success that she decided to leave the New York art scene um, to pursue her passions and uh, the development of her art out in New Mexico. And I imagine like for her, the land being so inspiring that it will have a similar effect on you. And also this idea that George O'Keefe repeatedly returned to painting Pedernal over and over and over again. I think it makes Kookaburra Nightingale so important in a way because it's the first time that you've painted this mountain and I would uh, presume that it's a theme that will return again and again over time in unique ways and surreal ways uh, in your work so that's that's quite exciting. Yeah yeah you know for me uh, the, the funny the funny uh, thing about the George O'Keefe um, vibe is that she was a minimalist. She loved the um, barrenness of this place. Um, and for me, I like something else about it. Um, the, the lack of foliage here, um, the lack of water, um, it's so opposite from a tropical rainforest. Um, there is something about the quiet and the solitude that makes me feel like I am more capable of going deeper into my own psyche. Um, so I don't necessarily have to pull from what's out there. I feel like it's easier now for me to go inside. So that's why I moved here is I liked the vibe. Wonderful. Um, and I imagine that that vibe will enhance the level of um, magical uh, realism that exists in your work also, which is inspired by Henri Rousseau, and I look forward to seeing that develop over time. Here we have a detailed shot of the foreground of one of Rousseau's paintings and the foreground of Kookaburra Nightingale to see this layering of uh, flora uh, in the foreground. It's really beautiful. Okay. Yeah, so let's go on to the second painting, mm -hmm. um, Foxtail Thicket. So Foxtail Thicket is another pretty large piece of mine. This, is, this piece is 72 inches wide, and um, she's a special little, little fox. I, um, I was given the reference photo from my friend Andre. Andre lives here in New Mexico, and um, this, this little lady apparently um, comes and peers into their kitchen window on a fairly regular basis. So I also have a painting of her called Equinox that is um, of her staring right at the viewer. So it, it, it wasn't until after this painting that I started to interpret what, what it was and why I had done it the way I had done it. Um, so to me, what I see here is uh, three eras of art. Um, in the foreground, as we look at that, um, uh, foliage that's the closest to us. That to me looks very post-impressionistic, like a Van Gogh. In the middle ground, the hillside behind her, she's got um, what looks like the, the pointillism uh, movement. And then in the far, far background, that thicket of forest. Yeah, see, here's a great example. Um, that's, the, that's my foliage on the left, and then this is the up close um, of a Van Gogh um, on the right. Here's um, pointillism on the left, a detail of Seurat, and then my, this is my middle ground. So they really look similar, and you know, I've, I've been staring at these pieces in museums for a couple decades now, obsessed with them. So it's no surprise that I would um, start to embed them, not necessarily consciously, into my works. Now that top, top layer, that thicket that we saw in the painting of the fox, 
um, that forest way behind her. I think that that looks a lot like the abstract expressionists. Um, I, I think particularly it looks like Joan Mitchell. And um, I believe we have, yeah, here we have a comparison. There's Joan Mitchell's work on the left. And even the palette was similar. Um, I didn't quite notice that until well after the painting was done. So, you know, in a way, I, I, I interpret this painting um, now that it's finished as, as I'm the fox. Um, painted in my very Iris Scott finger painting style and she's looking back into the history of art and um, these um, these periods of style that influence uh, the present. So that's what I see. I'll, hold, I'll turn it over to you guys. Yeah, thanks Iris. I, um, I really like this painting <laughs> a lot. Um, I think it's really well done. And I do think it shows in a fascinating way how you're situating yourself um, in a lineage and in um, sort of a, uh, the history of painting uh, in a really interesting way. Um, oftentimes we're pulled in all kinds of directions, you know, as people uh, and our identities can become, oh, sometimes I have on my teacher hat and sometimes I have on my husband hat and I have on um, this and that. So I like the way that this sort of synthesizes and brings together in a harmonious uh, your sort of painterly um, identity as you sit amidst this field here. I also think it shows off some of your technique, like the comparison to Van Gogh in the front, you see just a little bit of almost that impasto that uh, Van Gogh is famous for, very thickly applied paint, and we'll see that more in some of uh, Iris's other works. The wide open field, that field takes up a lot of space in the painting, but I think you make good use of that space with um, that almost pointillistic technique. And you'll notice in the Surat uh, close up, there's a lot of white space that gives these broken up colors a lot of luminosity. And you can see in irises there a little bit of uh, the white paint sort of like highlighting and really bringing to life uh, some of that foliage, uh, a little bit more mixing of the color in Iris's work than in uh, pointillism, which used the contrast of primary colors uh, to really make them pop. But I think Iris is achieving a really similar effect with like how uh, sort of generous she is with the painting there. Um, when we think about that abstract expressionism, that's really far, I think, sometimes from what Iris, uh, what Iris does, what the finished product looks like. But it, all, it really shows her underlying process, I think, because when she's drafting and laying down the initial marks of the painting, you get a much more expressionistic uh, under, um, um, layer underneath the, the finished work. And I think, Iris, is it fair for me to point out that what you have behind you there is an example of that uh, draftsmanship or draftsmanship? Yeah, yeah. So right behind me, um, we have a painting that I will, will be oil finger painting on top of. Um, but what I do before I start a work is I like to um, water down the oils. I work, that sounds strange, but I work with a, a special brand of oils that you can actually mix with water. Mm -hmm. And I do what's like a, a watercolor wash first because it's just so much less harsh on the eyes to paint on a color. And um, as we saw in that previous slide with that pointillism close up, my base layer was a bright, bright red. So um, it's, it's much more fun to work on a colored ground. And for all you painters out there, you, you must do it. It's the best. <laughs> Yeah, this uh, comparison, it's sort of unlikely, I think, with Joan Mitchell, but as we learn a little bit more about your process, I see it. But there's another part of it that I think maybe Gabrielle should speak to um, a bit about uh, the role of women and the value of their art in sort of the art world. Yeah, thanks, Donovan. Um, I found this intriguing when I came across uh, this image online on Christie's uh, Christie's Auction House site uh, from May of 2016, their sale. This work, uh, painted by Joan Mitchell, was uh, worked on at noontime over the course of about 40 years, just sort of continuing to come back and forth to it and adding some marks to the canvas um, up until 1992 when she died. That's when the, the work was, you know, less... I guess she would have kept going. Um, and we see a disparity uh, in auction sales between uh, female artists and male artists. 
Um, but this work, it was estimated between $5 million and $7 million and sold for close to $10 million, which I think is quite rare. And I think uh, Joan Mitchell is sort of underappreciated in the art world and should be a more, you know, sort of recognized. If you're, if you're very immersed in the art world, you know who she is. But I think perhaps the average individual uh, consuming art might not know. And uh, I think over time, she will become more and more of a household name as, as the next generation has the opportunity to write new art history books and promote more and more of these great female painters who had not gotten, you know, their due credit in their lifetimes. So it's interesting to see how value shifts over time. It's of interest to me, particularly because I'm also a fine art appraiser. So you were talking about wearing many hats earlier, Donovan. I've, I've got to juggle mine between philosopher, educator, art dealer, and appraiser. Um, so the art market is a, a magnificent beast, and understanding trends and waves in it is important. And I was also sort of personally delighted um, in the notion, Iris likes to talk about uh, that she will paint, you know, well into her 80s or 90s or, you know, until she's 100. And I, I fully believe that's going to be true. Yes. And um, <laughs> now that she's building this really large studio, I, I've sort of been prodding her a little bit to sort of tuck a, tuck a canvas off in a corner maybe and, and you know, come to it uh, once a year or something to work out new techniques, um, which I'm sure would look very different than this final result of this Joan Mitchell piece. But um, the idea of uh, slowly, slowly building a work over decades, I think, is, is really appealing and, and a nice way to kick off a, a new studio. That's, uh, that's not what I have to say about this. Well, it's funny you bring up the studio because um, um, I've always been working in somebody else's space as either a renter or um, my mother kindly allowing me to work in the basement 10 years ago. And I always have to be very, very careful. And um, pretty soon, within the next maybe three to four weeks, I will be moved into my own space that I own that I can make as big of a mess as I want to. And I think that it's going to be interesting to see how the art changes because I won't be limited worry worrying about the walls, basically. I'm going to, I'm going to fling paint like nobody's business. Um, can I just, uh, I think we should maybe start moving on to the next painting, but I did want to say uh, Su Yin Tan yes. asked us for the name of that Joni Mitchell painting, if we know the name of that. Oh, yeah. Oh. yeah. Um, yes. Okay, so the next painting is called Salvador. Salvador is a shaking wet dog. Um, this is a subject that um, you know I have, um, I have attacked many times um, over the course of the last 10 years. Um, the thing is though, this painting is quite a bit bigger than what I typically paint a shaking dog. And I've had to work my way up to this. It really has taken 10 years to figure out how to go this big. Um, at 96 um, inches wide by 72 inches tall, this thing is quite the beast. And uh, the model um, is named Max. Max lives here in New Mexico um, in a town ca called Coyote. And um, he is the dog of the host, the Airbnb host, where we lived for the first three months that we were here. And I knew I was going to get a shaking dog painting out of him. So he was such a water dog that he would even um, try to play in four inches of puddles. And um, once I made the piece, I was sort of astounded to realize that it looked exactly like Salvador Dali. There's a photograph um, that um, I was shown of the famous, um, uh, the famous artist, the famous eccentric. Foxy is back, by the way, because I'm talking about Max. Um, and I wanted to paint um, the piece. In fact, can we go to that slide of Salvador? I wanted to paint something that was sort of as um, eccentric in color as that artist. And, and I'm really happy with how this outrageous piece turned out. Um, whether or not it was an accident that I picked that or, or, or what, but it, I mean, it looks exactly like this photograph. So um, yeah, that was just one of those sort of magical coincidences that happen when you're a professional finger painter, I guess. 
this is uh, really interesting to move from talking about abstract expressionism to the dog paintings, because I think that part of Iris's like rebellion against the art world is against the the high level of abstraction and conceptualization that has been really dominant in the art world over really for almost a hundred years. Um, and so it's kind of daring on Iris's part to foreground representational images of animals with this wild color palette that she has. Um, I think it's really putting, it's putting some really interesting and important questions to the art world about the role and the nature of art, how accessible it should be. Um, and so these paintings are always uh, really interesting for me to consider as the sort of philosopher who thinks about like, what is this doing um, in relationship to, to art? Now I think that we're starting to see as Iris develops a little bit, this nod to Salvador Dali. So there are more subtle and nuanced things starting to happen in these dog paintings that I think are really interesting and are starting to show um, the, what was already beautiful works of art are starting to sort of like develop these layers to them. Um, so that's really uh, interesting for me to watch and, and it makes me think about them. Um, that's also interesting that, you know, dogs have had a long role in the history of art and so they haven't always been like disdained, you know, it's more of a sort of recent thing that animal imagery has been sort of like, oh, poo-pooed by um, the art world. Um, and it's also sort of fascinating that uh, Dali and Picasso have been photographed with this uh, Saluki, which Iris has painted um, before. Um, and it's one of the oldest, one of the oldest images that we have of dogs in the history of art is of a Saluki, which uh, it's ancient, right? Uh, there's an, a an ancient representation of this type of dog that Iris has painted and also that Dali had. Um, so I think we have a picture of a Saluki with I think Picasso um, as well. Um, and here is the ancient image of this type of dog uh, again. So it's almost like, you know, that whole cyclical nature of things, things come and go. Um, but they're always returning cut to the measure of our time and adapted into our moment and interpreted to sort of meet the needs uh, that we have right now that humans are calling out for sort of a return to something I think beautiful. Um, that's one of the things I enjoy talking with Iris about is to re-emphasize the, the beauty of things um, and what that really resonates in this sort of big wonderful um, show. So um, yeah, thank you uh, for that. And I think we could probably move on to the next. The next one is um, this lunar eclipse after Banksy. Right. Yeah, um, I have been painting dogs for a really long time and um, they don't, I don't think that they get enough credit in the art world. Um, I think that the subject of dogs is so important. Um, we take for granted how much we think of our, our little dogs and our cats as parts of the family. Um, I mean, we, my partner, Sasha, he lost his kitty recently and it was a complete tragedy. I mean, it was unbearable. And, um, my goal as an artist is for us to, um, someday get to a point where we perceive all the animals, including the rattlesnake as being a sacred little soul that is our brother or sister. And um, so let's, let's move on to, to this painting called Lunar Eclipse. Lunar Eclipse is also a gigantic piece. This is again, 96 inches wide by 72 inches tall. Much more of a limited palette than I usually work with. Normally you would see the features of a shaking dog I would do. But in this case, I decided to really blow out the features with backlighting and make the breed of the dog a little bit more ambiguous. I see maybe a mutt or maybe a black lab, perhaps a shepherd, um, but I want the viewer to see their dog here. Um, unlike Salvador in the painting, the prior painting, Salvador was, um, the splatter was made by throwing the paint, which I would thin down. But this painting is a little different. This is not a splatter painting like a Pollock. This is a, this is 100% um, finger um, stroke by finger stroke, a uh, finger painting. And um, 
it, the dog is standing on a sort of wet deck. You can sort of see there's these little lines at the bottom suggesting the wood. And you know what I really like about it is that it looks sort of celestial and um, like I feel like I see stars out there. But um, the little secret behind this painting and the reason we ca call it after Banksy is um, in the tradition of nodding to artists that one admires, the painting is a reversal of um, a famous piece that he made uh, a graffiti work in around 2007 on the West Bank of Gaza. And in that piece, his, his um, shaking dog was a white dog with black splatter faced the opposite direction. So um, yes, this is my little nod to him. And um, I'll let Gabby speak here. Uh, she has um, really interesting insights on uh, contemporary art. I was really excited to learn that this work was inspired by Banksy's uh, painting, Wet Dog, um, because when I first looked at it, I just was overwhelmed with it being beautiful and lush and the, the yellow light around the, the rump of the painting, as you were describing to us, is so uh, vivid here and adds so much to the overall composition. So my initial thoughts on the painting were, oh, just loving it for what's on the canvas. But to learn that you were inspired by this work, uh, really, I thought, um, added to a richer meaning to it and places the painting also in this historical narrative about the importance of depictions of dogs on walls, which we can find dating back, to, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago in uh, the Middle East of uh, hunters going out with, uh, on, on walls, you know, uh, depictions of hunters tether with tethering uh, their domesticated animals uh, along with them. And so the idea that, um, you know, Banksy is a controversial figure, not everyone appreciates um, the work that's made or the places that they're put. But I like the idea that this artist or this collective, who knows who Banksy really is, um, I like that this artist and their output is so oriented towards trying to provoke dialogue. I, I don't think uh, Banksy's work is just meant to um, be a rebel rouser or jokester or a provocateur. It really uh, digs at trying to overcome people's fixed beliefs and, and open up dialogue about injustices in the world one way or the other. Regardless of what your position is on a given topic, Banksy likes to stir dialogue about it. And so uh, I like that, that you, you appreciate that also, Iris, because there is a lot of issues in the world that need to be tackled and artists speak to our hearts in a way or speak for the the silenced voices otherwise and for you to be able to draw attention to animals in need or different issues in the world through your work and through such joyous work that there is there is a deeper underpinning to the work for people to find if they're seeking it um, i find that really deeply meaningful uh, and also I think the Banksy is an interesting story in terms of uh, art law. You know, you have a work of art placed in, uh, in a particular co location for public consumption. It's illegally removed. It ends up in an art institution. Uh, and so seeing as how this, the life of this painting by Banksy is still yet to be determined where it will end up, what will happen to it. So it's, um, you know, Maybe someday we can see these two paintings next to each other somewhere. I think that would be that would huh. be exciting. We'll yes. Yeah. Well, I, I would like. Yeah, we'll see. I'll be painting for sixty more years, so there's a chance. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's move on to tent collage. No. Yes. So, so. Um, in the next uh, slides, we have the octopus. So on the left side, we have sweet hour drops, and on the right side, we have tentacolage. Sweet hour drops is a, is a tinier study, just 16 by 16 inches, and um, tentacolage is much bigger, um, all the way to 40 inches and 40 inches tall. Um, it's funny because as soon as I um, got to the desert, I started learning about and looking at the layers um, of where the ocean 
um, used to be. That's what's so beautiful about New Mexico is that here in the, can in the canyons, you can um, look down 300 million years. So I kind of, I was thinking a lot about um, the marine and I was also sort of shocked by how dry everything was when I first got here and I started to really crave um, the water. So I began um, listening to this fabulous book on Audible while I was painting called The Soul of an Octopus. And I have been, well, first of all, the first fun fact is that I learned that the word octopi is a misnomer, so that is not correct. The plural of octopus is octopuses, which doesn't sound right to our ears, but it is true. Um, so on the one on the left, it looks a little bit more like a uh, textile, in my opinion. Um, I think that's, to me, it looks a lot like little sequins um, on a textile. And um, it's, it's so stylized that it's even kind of hard to see um, the octopus. Um, I really like finger painting. Um, these suckers, finger painting loves texture. It loves to work very impasto. And so I'm always kind of hunting for subject matter that's really good at, uh, that finger painting is really good at. Um, now, in the case of Foxy, for example, um, her fur is not good uh, to finger paint unless I paint her head like five feet tall, which I've done. <laughs> So she is just completely asleep. <laughs> I'm going to put her back on my lap. Um, so uh, what I've been learning about um, the octopus is um, through these anecdotes of aquarium workers. And the, the, um, there is a deepness to their personalities and a mystery. They're, they are so different than us and yet so um, intelligent. And um, one of the, the fastest growing animals in the world, they go from the size of a piece of rice all the way up to a giant Pacific octopus in just four years. And then they tragically die as soon as they lay their eggs. Um, they'll starve themselves during that, that period that they are caring for the eggs. And it just, it, I would, I, I, about three times during this, audiobook I burst into tears when yet another octopus in this aquarium dies of old age and I bonded with her over the course of the, the chapter. So I mean they have they have brain neurons in their arms, they taste with their suckers, um, they're just so mysterious and the fact that they can change their colors. I, I can't even begin to paint at a level of color work that they live and so I'm gonna keep attack, tackling this subject until I can maybe get there, but um, I don't know how I'm going to be able to paint color changing, um, but you know, whatever, we have 60 more years of, of my career, maybe I'll figure that out. But, um, you know, I wanna bring up though that, um, you know, this animal is associated with slimy and gross maybe, and again, like my goal is always to just kind of make people fall in love. I just am so in love with animals. They're so special, they're so divine. I think of them as like little gods. I can't believe, I cannot believe I am allowed to have a miniature lion in the house. That is my friend. <laughs> like, that is just the most miraculous thing in the world. And while um, I wouldn't um, probably own an octopus, I, I would like to deep down. So um, yeah, I think that Painting animals is incredibly important and is um, the future of um, artistic trends because I think we're moving out um, of, a, of a period of time when animals are and the environment are just not that important, right? That's what it's been like for the last hundred years. What's important is what's going on in the human mind, right? But I think at least we really need to get out of our heads and, and come back to the wonder that's right outside. Yeah, uh, this attitude that Iris brings to her paintings is really, I think, shaping the type of image that she's producing. In the case of octopuses specifically, for a long time, octopuses were even more than just slimy or gross, but representations of evil, like in this uh, propaganda cartoon, or in the legend of the Kraken that's bringing down the ship, you know, this horror that, that brings sailors to their uh, watery grave. Um, but I think that 
uh, Iris is offering and is part of a real sea change in how we understand uh, the octopus, uh, especially in the last uh, couple of decades as we learn more about how profoundly intelligent octopuses are um, and how they do all kinds of, they play, they collect things, they make little piles of interesting objects outside of their dens that they just... Yeah, they decorate. They de yeah, they decorate. Yeah. I mean, they have, they, they do these behaviors that are really a mark of a high level of intelligence. Um, and these eyes in Iris's paintings that kind of peek out, uh, especially in tentacolage, I really like how the eye of the octopus is really coming out through. It demands a kind of recognition. And I think that that's a theme in this particular collection, that these animals are looking at you, that they're demanding a kind of recognition, which is an ethical call to consider them in their sentience, in their intelligence. Um, and that's part of the sort of environmental activism part of Iris's work to really bring this uh, appreciation and respect to animals to the foreground. We've seen contemporary artists mm -hmm. like Murakami do more sort of cartoonish and cutesy things with octopuses that are a little bit more over the top. But the attitude that Iris is bringing is really, she spoke of divinity, it's more one of reverence uh, and respect. Um, that is still has a little bit of playfulness to it. The, the octopus paintings are very vibrant. There's a lot of motion in them, uh, but she's really uh, asking us to consider um, the octopus and these other animals as um, creatures that are deserving of our ethical consideration and of, of moral worth uh, in a way. And I, I, philosophically, I think that's a really important um, idea that art can bring out and can en encourage mm -hmm. us to dialogue about. So I'll let Gabrielle, mm -hmm. I think, introduce the next series of paintings that are related in a way. Sure, yeah, thanks Donovan. Um, so the last three paintings we'll look at uh, are all, all come from source photos from our friends in Wayzata, Wayzata uh, the Burnett's, Peggy Burnett, um, is a photographer uh, who traveled to India and snapped these photos while on a safari. And I'd love to have Iris um, go into detail about that and what it was like to receive them uh, and be able to create these works of art based on that source photography. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, the, I had never met actually anyone that had gone on to a safari in India for photos. And so I got this fabulous dump of imagery and it included tigers and owls and these fabulous Indian rollers, and among other animals, including the hornbill, which you'll see later. And um, so I, I just started tackling them. And in this particular painting, um, the birds were actually in two separate photographs. And I didn't love the background. Um, that's one of the problems with photography is um, it's hard enough getting the little subject in focus, let alone getting a fabulous background and fabulous lighting, right? So what I did is I blew out the background and I replaced it with this sort of ambiguous orby um, landscape. I see blossoms there, even look, what looks like dandelions. Those don't even exist on those trees, but I felt they needed it. And then when it came time to paint the, the leaves of the tree on the left, um, I didn't go from uh, what was actually in the photo. What instead I did is I took the exact palette that was um, on the bird's bodies and I just started mixing it all together with my palette knife and throwing it on that canvas. And some of those leaves are really, really thick and juicy. Um, but, but by the time I was done with this piece along with the other two, um, it occurred to me that um, a painter working with photo safari images has the very special opportunity to sort of replace taxidermy. And I think that we should most definitely be leaving that behind and moving into an era where we don't shoot animals, we paint them. So, this is very special. I've made a trophy for the person on safari. I would love to do more of these pieces. And um, one of my favorite parts about the coloring of these birds is so we call them jewel tones, but 
her iridescent little belly, um, uh, cha tra it transforms from like pink and peach and white down to lilac, lavender, and then cobalt turquoise and down to her little claws. And weaving those colors together was so much fun. And I can't do that unless the bird is like this big. So um, I've got to paint larger than life because my fingers are, are not so skinny. Um, and I, I can't do super fine details unless I paint pretty large. So the obstacle is the way here. So this is a 36 inch tall by 40 inch wide piece. And now let's move on to the next painting. Um, also from India, this painting is called Indian Owl Spotted. Indian Owl Spotted is 40 by 40 inches tall. And what I found so unusual about um, this uh, reference photo was that the bird was staring down at the photographer in the middle of the damn day. So um, fascinated by that, I decided to like turn up the volume of that um, color. So I ramped up the white. I, I literally painted this with, um, oh, there's a bunny outside. A bunny just ran by. Go New Mexico. <laughs> um, magical, big, wonderful. <laughs> Good thing Foxy didn't see that. So anyway, the background is pure titanium white. And instead of just a yellow, I used a very special color by Holbein uh, paint, which is called Luminous Lemon. It literally is a glowing color. Hard to tell in a JPEG, but in real life, that sucker glows like a neon um, lamp. And um, yeah, like who does this little owl think she is? You know, like what is she up to? And she's just staring down with just lovely curiosity at the viewer. Um, I really feel like there's a little dialogue going on here. Um, and for me, it would just be such a treat to see an owl. I've only heard them a few times here. Um, but that's what, that's what this painting is about for me. That's how, that's what I have to say about that. Mm -hmm. So the next painting is um, also a bird, also from India. Um, this painting is titled, If These Walls Could Squawk. And um, we're missing a little bit on the top and the bottom. It's a little bit longer of a piece, but um, the hornbill is such a bizarre creature. Um, I mean, it, they literally have a bright red eye. In her reference photo, the eye was um, muddy. You couldn't tell because of the, the lighting of the day. So I had to hunt down one individual eye from the internet and um, plunk it into there to make it look right. Um, the branch is covered in sort of these lichen and it has a, a what looks like to me like a wallpaper background. So um, when, I, when I showed this photo to Gabrielle um, of the gallery, um, she immediately was like, oh my God, do you know what this looks like? And she sent me a photo. And um, I'm gonna actually send it over to Gabrielle now, but sometimes when you're an artist, um, you paint things and then you're surprised to discover that maybe you painted it because you'd seen something else, even though you weren't even aware of that. So um, I was kind of blown away by the similarity here. One second, I don't know where that's my name. Okay, so um, thanks to Iris for that. Um, so this is a portion where we'd like to try to engage you all in a little bit of an exercise on slow looking, close looking, um, comparing the work by Iris, if these walls could squawk, with this work by Vincent van Gogh, painted in 1889, called The Postman, which is part of the Barnes Foundation's collection. Um, so I, it would be great, Donovan, if perhaps you could um, start to initiate a little bit of a Q&A with the audience to get them to um, offer up some observations. Yeah, so I would think it would, it would be really great if people who are in attendance could kind of take some time and look over these two paintings. And as ideas come to you, you can use the Q&A function to make some kind of comparative statement about these two paintings. Like, what do you see? What's drawing your eye in these two paintings? And what is connecting them in your mind? And so I would love if we could see come in a couple of statements about the uh, paintings. And then even maybe more important than just the statement, tell us a little bit about 
why, just a sentence or two, it doesn't have to be a, some long manuscript or something, but just a sentence or two about why. So we want sort of two things. We want what you see and why or how you see it. Um, so go ahead and take just a moment. And as soon as you want to, feel free to use that Q&A uh, function to just start uh, giving us some insight that you're having about the relationship between these two photos, which I think are really um, striking uh, in a way. I, uh, uh, Gabrielle, what sort of set this off initially? We do have some things coming in. So uh, go ahead, just real briefly, what was the first sort of like, what made the connection for you? Well, I've been looking at this Van Gogh painting for 13 or 14 years. I studied at the Barnes Foundation for three years. I taught there um, as a docent for uh, adult programming and also teaching K through 12 art education to kids. Um, so I've, I've stood in front of this painting talking about it many, many, many times over the course of my life. and. Um, it's such a stark modern image. It was so revolutionary in a way to put a figure so far forward in the compositional plane against that uh, flat background and the subtle ways that Van Gogh uses uh, mark making to show uh, the illusion of the recession of space. Um, which I won't uh, say directly what he did there. Maybe someone else can point out or take a guess as to what they what he thinks uh, what they think Van Gogh did. And I also see a little similarity in uh, in Iris's work, particularly in that instance of demarcating color units from one another and establishing uh, foreground, middle ground, background, which is all all an illusion, of course, right? These, uh, these ways of uh, using mark making to establish different planes. Um, so, yeah. I just want to draw some attention to comments coming in from the participants, uh, so. Do you wanna, why don't you read some to us, Donovan? Yeah, I would really like to. People are really jumping. So uh, Karen Abertot mentions these blossoms in the background, that they're amazingly similar, but they don't distract or take away from the subject. Um, Iris, I just really briefly because I want to I want to mention uh, Annie Vernot's uh, comment here. The the paintings are the the blossoms are a little bit similar because the background in the Van Gogh is a Japanese wallpaper. What are the what are you doing with the flowers in the hornbill uh, if these walls can squawk painting? Mm -hmm. So that particular particular style of flower popped up in a painting called Aquarian Bloom um, a few months before this painting and I, you know, I thought I had invented it but uh, lo and behold maybe I had seen something very similar to this. Um, uh, yeah these little dials of pink. Um, I, I love um, Japanese cherry blossoms and can't get enough of them um, and I think that what Van Gogh um, uh, one of the comments I saw, and I'm not quite sure who, you'll have to tell me who said this, but they made the comparison that the hat of the postman, it is so similar to the hat of the hornbill, you know, <laughs> like they literally are both wearing hats, <laughs> and both <laughs> of the hats are black and yellow. Um, I saw another question, someone asked me about um, the black, you know, that's, uh, that's a question that comes up a lot, is like, how do you, how do you paint with black? And um, in my case, I, I like to use a mixture of all my darkest colors just sort of mushed together because it makes a more iridescent black like the belly of a bird. Yeah, we're, I love that hat connection. I was looking for, I'm trying to juggle the Q&A with the chat function. So I'm looking for who brought the, oh, uh, Mayoran uh, Menohara, I think. Uh, said, the, mentioned the hat, but we have several people noticing, I think, a strong connection, um, which is the hat there. Um, we also had this interesting comment from uh, Jennifer Phelps that mentions, of course, they're both portraits, right? I think that's an important connection to make. And the eyes, the way the eyes and the hornbill sort of like flatten them out, they both have a very sort of flat quality to them. Maybe the Van Gogh a little bit more so, as if the postman is like up against the wall, whereas there's some depth there. Um, so what you saw some of that depth, I think, Iris, yourself. Can you talk about in the, these walls could swap? Um, uh, Vandana Churavedi also mentions these eyes, that they are really draws to the tension and have a similar expression to them. 
Mm -hmm. um, yeah, the crazy eyes. I mean, mm -hmm. mine has a hyper red. Uh, the postman has a hyper blue eye. Both are very unusual, rare eye colors. Um, one of the differences is the postman is up against the wall and Van Gogh has um, painted a little green shadow on the right side of the man's face. Yep, there it is. Um, I didn't do that. I, I did something that was uh, further away and I wanted it to be like, is that wallpaper or is that really just really great foliage? Um, so that's one of the little differences there. I really still can't believe um, that this Van Gogh exists. I really don't recall seeing this painting ever, um, even though I love Van Gogh and thought I'd seen all his works. Um, someone else mentioned that the beard of the postman is um, really similarly executed to the, the branch that the bird is standing on. There's a lot of these swirls of um, greens and browns and sapia hues. So that's interesting and cool. Uh, I like the close-up here a lot. I think the eyes are so striking. Mm -hmm. um, there's, I've always thought that there's a little hint of sadness or some emotional sort of activity happening within the postman, but there's more of a level of confidence in, in the hornbill uh, or um, oh, yeah. that, you know, oh, yeah. when you look this closely, he's, uh, there's something, uh, something curious happening, um, but there's, there's a reservation, there's a concern in the eyes of the postman. Um, as I would imagine sitting there, he was a, 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 an actual human being sitting in front of Van Gogh having his portrait painted, uh, which occurred six or seven times over the course of a year. Um, so I imagine if you sat in front of Van Gogh uh, to be painted, you'd probably look quite curious uh, at this um, character. Yeah. Uh, whereas yeah. Hornbill looking at you, I'm sure is quite pleased. So, um, so I, th uh, I, to I think all Hornbills are quite pleased with themselves. I want to just mention one last uh, comment from Jennifer Sager about how both, even though both of the subjects are still, she says, uh, Jennifer says, the paint strokes give us a sense of life and movement. And I really think that that is not just true of this particular painting. I think it's a very keen observation, but is also true generally of Iris's work. That one of the things that her technique is doing um, that I find sort of philosophically interesting is to bring this sort of like vivacity and uh, life, the moving quality of life to these animals. So it's not just a sort of still stuffy portraiture. Um, so if you'd like, Iris, we can take some general comments now. Mm -hmm. We spent a little bit of time. Thank you, everyone. Your comments are so awesome. Um, if you want us yeah. to maybe yeah. reach out to us and we could share some of these comments on social media and talk a little bit more about them because we really got um, you have a sharp set of, uh, of, uh, of fans and appreciators <laughs> out there, Iris. So, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd love to be able to talk more about some of, some of these excellent comments. We had some early comments coming in about your process. Do you want to talk about some of those? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's talk about process. And I think that in the um, near future, we'll do a demo um, using a, a gimbal uh, that can move around and go close and far away and do um, a really close up look at how, how I paint and why I make these decisions. But in a general way, if you're new to my, um, my art technique, it's, uh, it's strictly oil finger painting. I, um, I only use Holbein Duo Aqua Oils. They're a very special oil that can actually bond with water. Um, typically, I use them straight out of the tube. I don't thin them out unless I may be painting a shaking dog and throwing the paint to create that splatter effect. I most of the time like a really, really thick, thick paint. And so um, I have a mixing palette next to me and um, I use a palette knife and sometimes I mix right on the canvas. Um, people a lot of times want to know like, what fingers am I using? For the most part, I don't use my thumb. It really can't do anything very good. And occasionally I use the pinky when I'm doing some really active stroke work. But um, as you can see behind me, this is a base layer um, because I don't like to work on white before I start um, a painting. This is going to become a very large uh, vase of Actually, I'm not going to tell you. That's going to be a surprise, but it has something to do with the vase. Um, I've been finger painting for 10 years. 
Um, I started um, in 2009 by accident when I was living in Taiwan. I moved to Taiwan after I graduated college to take a year off. And while I was there, I was like, hmm, what should I do with myself? Let's see. Uh, I'm going to go buy some art supplies. I wasn't finger painting yet at all. I, I didn't think of art as a potential career. I had never really seen anyone have it as a career. Um, and my intention was to come back to the United States a year later and, and enter the workforce as a fourth grade teacher. That was my dream. And I still, you know, part of me would have loved to be a fourth grade teacher. But nevertheless, I started painting and um, people started asking if they were for sale on Facebook. And then I stumbled upon finger painting. And that, that was, I thought it was more interesting to look at. It reminded me of Van Gogh. And the audience liked it much more than my brush paintings. So I threw out the brushes very aggressively into the garbage. And I bought some better gloves. And um, the rest is history. I have really focused on just finger painting since then. And um, I typically um, paint animals. It seems to be like my focus. Landscapes. People also occasionally. And... Um, I'm recently living in now in New Mexico, and I look forward to what this place is going to, how it will change the, the art. Can we go back just a second to your drafting? Uh, Simone has asked how you wash the base. How do you create that? Um, okay, so what I do is I spray the, the white canvas with a spray bottle, and then I put the oil paint um, onto a, I have a layer of glass on my palette and I make a really flat layer like you're frosting a cake and then I spray that with water and then I chop that up and mix it so it'll bond with the water because it doesn't really want to bond with the water but it will, will bond with it if you work it hard and then I get it so it's super super thin as thin as I can get it like the consistency of like a smoothie and then I pour that into a bowl and then I throw the paint. Um, that's what I'm doing a splatter painting. But in this case, um, that thin sort of smoothie um, uh, consistency is perfect for a wash. Um, I think that we have gone a little bit over time. Um, we probably need to wrap, okay. but I, I do have one last question from Tina Evans that I do wanna ask. Is there going to be any sort of like a book uh, on your process or any sort of book really in the future? What do you see your relationship with the yeah. book production? <laughs> Yes, yes. So my significant other, Sasha, he it happens to be a fabulous writer and we are together. He's ghostwriting. He's together. We're working on building a book that is not only a um, sort of a how to draw, how to paint and even how to finger paint, but also how to um, make good choices on building a collection, how to market your art and how to build your audience online in a sustainable way. Um, because you do not need to wait to be discovered. You need to start with baby steps and small paintings and keep your prices very low in the beginning. And anybody can do this. It's learned, it's not a talent. And um, I really look forward to releasing that book in the near future. Thanks for, for sharing that. Uh, that work in progress with us. Uh, so I think, uh, Iris, is it true that you're going to continue to maybe take some questions and chat with people um, on yeah, another Yeah, I'd be happy to. Maybe on Instagram mm -hmm. or something. Uh, like yeah, that. yeah, that's a good idea. And I too, I would like to save some of these questions and return to them and uh, chat uh, a little bit more about some of these really excellent comments and, and questions that we got in today. So I really, really want to thank um, the participants and the, and the audience listening today. You were really generous um, and insightful with, with your comments. So um, that gives us a lot of food for thought. And uh, I, I happen to be in the business of thought. So I really enjoyed that. Thank you very much. Uh, Gabrielle. Do thank you, you Donovan. Thank yeah. you, Gabrielle. Uh, thanks, guys, so much. Iris, thank you for the art and for sharing the insights. Donovan, thank you for your facilitation. Um, and thank you to the audience for spending this time with us. We're so pleased to be able to present the work to you in this new way. And um, this is not the last time. I'm sure we will be doing this uh, often, as often as we need, as yeah. often as we can. And um, we're all learning and everybody needs to, in this world, develop their technology skill set more and more. And so we're excited to see, you know, what the future holds for presenting art, not just in galleries, but in engaging directly with people 
um, mm -hmm. over these, um, these video chat functions and screen sharing opportunities. So thank and you. And happy birthday, Iris. And happy birthday. Oh, yeah. 36 today. I'm, ha I'm having a very happy birthday. Nice. Uh, okay. Have a good day, everybody. Thank you. Yeah, happy thank painting. You again, everybody, very much. Cheers. Mm -hmm.